Welcome to the Cult of the Clock Tower. I am Andrew Nathanson. Every other week, a special guest and I have an in-depth discussion about a character from the game Blood on the Clock Tower. Today's character is Vortox, a demon from the Sex and Violets edition, whose ability reads, each night, choose a player, they die. Good abilities yield false information. Each day, if no one was executed, evil wins. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I'm joined once again by Brian. Today, we're going to be discussing the Vortox. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing pretty well. So, Vortox, obviously a big deal in this edition. Uh, Kind of most games center around it, uh, even when it's not in play, to some extent at least, right? (laughs) Yeah, I feel like when, you know, people are first kind of getting up to the advanced scripts and they, uh, or intermediate scripts, rather, they, uh read through the characters and they get down to the demons and go wait what (laughs) and it seems really really strong when you first read it because it just makes everything false and you have to execute people but it's not as scary as it looks (laughs) yeah it's like it seems like both both parts of it the the false information and the having to execute every day are less impactful on the game than you might expect well i I mean the the reversing all information is impactful but it's not as big a deal as it seems like it'll be to overcome exactly if you know there's a vortex in play it's almost like it still makes things a little bit harder to figure out but not really much and i think that's important to mention is that the vortex makes all information from good abilities false not yeah treating them all as if they're poisoned where it can be true or false or whatever the storyteller wants kind of Right, yeah. If, if it was, like, poisoned information, then, I mean, then, like, why are you even playing the game? You're just getting completely <laughs> You're just everything. getting random things. But since it's reversed, then, you know, if you do manage to figure out that it's a Vortex, which you probably will at some point during the game, you mm-hmm. can kind of flip everything. In order yeah, so the key, is, the key is that your information is still re- reliable. It's just... And, and it still gives you information. It's just you have to reverse it all. Well, some some information you can't reverse, like clockmaker info or whatever, but all of the binary yes or it's no. It's reliably wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know everything Everything you know, you now know the opposite of it. But yeah, so I, th- I think that's the biggest thing. Um, as far as actually playing as the Vortex, that's also something you have to keep in mind, is that like the players will be able to track you down as soon as they know you're in play, uh, pretty much as easily as they would be able to any other demon. Like I would, I would argue that as far as adding misinformation to the game, the Nodashi does a much stronger job of that than the Vortex, although the Nodashi, of course, comes with a pretty heavy downside to that, which is that you can figure out where they are from that misinformation. But like adding two players being drunk or poisoned actually reduces the amount of information in the game by way more than just making all information false. Well, and that's the thing with the misinformation, is if you have a little bit of misinformation and then some correct information... Those kind of mix together to be more confusing than if everything is just straight up wrong, because it might still be able to lead you to conclusions. They might be wrong conclusions, or sometimes you can get all wrong information and still kill the right person. I've definitely (laughs) seen that happen. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, so let's let's talk about playing as the Vortox, and then we'll get into more about, uh, you know, the second section, which is fighting the Vortox. So playing as the Vortox. I think one of the biggest things you want to be thinking about is what narrative you're going to push as far as whether or not uh you're accepting that there's a vortex in play and like all and the whole evil team is kind of going along with it or if the evil team is trying to push back and make it so that it's confusing whether or not there's a vortex in play uh there's pros and cons to each i mean i've i've found that depending on your meta of course um people will generally find out if there's a vortex within the first couple days or at least have a strong feeling one way or the other yeah. Uh, so if I'm on an evil team with the Vortox, I tend to just play along with the Vortox thing from the start. However, I've also seen it work well, you know, in both directions. A really strong way to do it can be having somebody privately claiming an outsider because Vortox doesn't mm-hmm. add an outsider, uh, but one of the other demons, the Fangu, does. 
So that can throw enough kind of confusion about it into there as well. Yeah, and it can also be really helpful to try to make it look like there's an Odashi so that like if there are one or two pieces of misinformation that everyone notices, if they're conveniently placed, you might be able to pin somebody as being the Nodashi. Absolutely. Make sure you leave them alive for a while. But yeah, it, it can be very hard to make it so that it's not clear that there's a Vortex in play, especially if the group has a strong meta of Vortex checking, like you were saying. Like if the artist is always using their question to ask about the Vortex, then, I mean, it's going to be really hard to conceal it from them. And in general, I'd say it's easier to easier to play it where everybody knows there's a vortex and then you're just playing accordingly and it's also one of the things with the misinformation is for the binary obviously you know if they're just getting a yes or no you know which answer they're probably going to be getting but for the Mm -hmm. ones like say the clockmaker or savant or whatever you know that they're getting wrong info but you still don't know what that information might be telling them or who it might be pointing toward Whereas, you know, in a, in a normal game where everybody's just getting true information or most people are getting true information, you probably know what kind of information they're getting because your team is the ones that they're getting information about. Yeah, actually, with that in mind, it can actually kind of open up some bluffs for you, uh, knowing that there's a Vortex in play, if you're going to be playing along with that narrative. Uh, for instance, it can be pretty hard to bluff Dreamer because you have to be able to tell people what character they are. But if there's a Vortex in play, then and everybody is expecting there to be a Vortex in play, then it can be a lot easier to bluff something like Dreamer, where no matter what information you give, it's going to... Well, I mean, if you give true information, then that might be... Like, <laughs> if you accidentally give true information early, then maybe you want to start thinking, like, oh, maybe I should just start pushing that there's not a Vortex in play. And people will be like, yeah, well, how, how could you have known my character? But if you give wrong information and everyone else starts realizing their information's wrong, then, hey, it's a Vortex game. Everyone knows that, so of course you could still... And you have a really good chance if you're, you know... For the evil, you can literally just say anything because you know who's evil. Yeah. And for the good, yeah. you've got, what, a 1 in 13, 1 in 17 chance of hitting the correct character? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so chances are you're probably going to get false information. It's a lot easier to get false information. That's kind of true for, like, the savant and stuff, too. Like, mm-hmm. you might not know exactly what information you want to be saying is true, but as a savant making up making up any information has a pretty good chance to be false, especially if you just get really specific with it. (laughs) Yeah, I will say that that for Savant, it can be a little bit more obvious, because I feel like you don't have the benefit of the storyteller knowing like what interesting pieces of false info to give you, because usually if there is a Savant in a Vortex game, the storyteller is going to be still giving them pieces of information that like when they realize they're false, it's going to lead to interesting conclusions. Yeah. And that's a little bit harder to do when you're bluffing Savant. Absolutely. But yeah, it is just in general easier to come up with false information than true. (laughs) What are times when you would play more into making it look like there isn't a Vortex in play? I already mentioned one, which is like pretending you're the dreamer and then getting a really lucky call at the start. Um, Yeah, that that would certainly influence that decision for me. If you're accidentally uh, getting giving true information. um, Honestly, I think that if a lot of the town seems to kind of just be leaning that way already. Like, if you're talking to people and people go, oh, yeah, no, we seem to be leaning toward this particular thing or something like that, and you go along with them, even if they do find out later that it's Vortox, because, you know, they probably will at some point, at least, Mm -hmm. most likely, it's not going to be that you're to blame for it. It's not like you're the one who said, oh, it's this. You can say, oh, well, yeah, everybody was saying that they had true information or only this one person was getting wrong information. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. If you are early on the only person giving good information, you're the one pushing that it's not a Vortex game, then when people figure out that it is, it's going to be pretty obvious that you're bluffing. Yeah, and I wouldn't lean like really hard into, oh, it's definitely not a Vortex. You know, I'm the artist and I asked that question and it's definitely not a Vortex kind of thing. But if you can kind of give information that, like, could be true, could be false, as far as the good team is concerned, Mm -hmm. then you can kind of play that road in the middle a little bit where uh, it could be a Vortex, but I think it's really more of an Odashi, and that's why this person's information is so Mm -hmm. clearly wrong. Yeah, that's a good good point. There are other times when I think I would do that as well, which are, like, particularly going for alternate win condition kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, the only real example of that is with the evil twin. Like, if there's a lot of information pointing to the evil twin being the good twin, or vice versa. Basically, if if the town has a lot of information pointing to the wrong twin and they're thinking of executing one of them. Yeah. 
then giving some that would be the time when i think i would most be inclined to go for like a really big big play where i'm like here is some piece of obviously true information therefore it's not a vortex game if you think that you can get it to end right there and you won't get to the point where uh yeah, they exactly. start being suspicious of you. If there's only a little bit of information out there in the first place, then they don't really know if it's true or false yet. Yeah, and most groups, I think, won't actually be willing to execute if they don't have enough information to figure that out. But it's it's worth thinking about just in case the opportunity arises. Absolutely, and I mean, if there's like two or three people that seem to corroborate something, then that would be the time that maybe they would. Yeah. Even if they normally wouldn't. Another good time to do that would be if the dreamer got a read on you or your minion on a thing that they like happen to bluff. That could be a good time to try to convince them that they're they're getting true information. Yeah, absolutely. Or even if if the savant has a similar thing, dreamer and savant are often going to come up as <laughs> their characters that get ver- that can get very powerful information from time to time. Another another situation is if the artist asks the question, "Are you the demon?" like when you actually yeah. are, in fact, the demon. If they ask if you're the demon and they get a no, then you're really going to want to make sure they don't find out it's a Vortox game because then they, <laughs> they know it's you. Absolutely. Assuming, you know, if people can even believe them in the first place. Either that or you know, maybe try making them look suspicious earlier anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but that actually is a... That, I feel like... I feel like that's a situation that I haven't seen come up very often, but I really like the play of the artist just asking if a particular person is the demon. I have definitely had somebody come up as an artist day one and ask, is this person the demon, and had to tell them yes before. So, (laughs) Of course, if they ask it about somebody else and they get told a yes, because they are not, then they'll probably try to get them killed and figure out pretty quickly that uh, they were not, in fact, the demon. Right. Or maybe try to kill them before uh... they do. Yeah, that's usually something that I, or that that's something I'm going to talk about more on the artist episode, but I feel like there's a whole class of questions like that, where it's like you ask something that most likely you're going to get a certain answer, and then that's your way of figuring out if it's a Vortex, because it's like either you just win or you figure out it's a Vortex. <laughs> yep. But yeah, so if, if you're in a situation like that, that's another time you might want to do that. I do think that if people are leaning toward kind of one person, because maybe the the false information is pointing at them. Sometimes they'll, you know, want to wait another day before executing them mm-hmm. because either they don't trust somebody or they want to see who dies at night. And it can be interesting to potentially target that suspicious person, which you normally wouldn't do, to kind of try to make it look like a, uh, a Fengu passed, oh, passed on to a different demon, depending on how the information is coming out, obviously. but And that fits with the whole thing about making the Fengu as the as an easy thing to make it look like there is instead of a vortex by just claiming an outsider yeah it's sort of like when you kill somebody suspicious to make it look like they star passed as an imp so <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah because that, that's actually yeah like you were saying that's kind of the best situation is if the info is pointing towards them but that would require the info to be true then they die yeah then that's going to really make it seem like fangu because the info seems true and it seems like they're escaping is there any other things that would particularly make you want to make people not know there's a Vortox in play? I mean, the really strong things for uh, with the Vortox are the, are the characters that do get binary information. The Oracle, Flower Girl, Artist, Juggler, Town Crier even, for finding out who the minions are. Um, because if they do learn that it's a Vortox, then they will know what the true information is, mm-hmm. which other people's information you know they'll know that one particular thing that they were told isn't true but they don't know what the actual true information is yeah so having those in play would make you want like having a lot of binary info characters like that in play would make it so that if you can convince them that there's not a vortex then it's going to be more misinformation than usual it leads yeah directly away instead of just kind of Oh, some of this is wrong, but it's it's straight up leading toward anyone but you at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I have some notes here on making it look like there's a Nodashi in play instead of a Vortox. Yeah. Like you mentioned earlier, you really want to make sure you're not killing the Nodashi candidates in that case. So if there are two people who, like say there is a Savant and a Dreamer, and they're near each other, those are going to be really obvious sources of misinformation. Like Flower Girl, Town Crier, all that kind of stuff. It's really hard to tell if they're getting bad information. But there are certain characters who can get obvious misinformation. And if they're near each other and there's only one or two people in between them, then that can be a time to make it look like Nodashi. And you really want to be making sure you're supporting the other people who aren't them 
and making it seem like their info is correct and don't kill the people between them. <laughs> That's really all I have to say about making it look like Nodashi. It can be strong, but you really have to think ahead. You can do something similar sort of with the Vigor Mortis as well. Um, if you, you know, are killing people who are next to some of the stronger misinformation, depending on whether they realize early on or if they only start noticing it in the later days. Mm-hmm. Um, because you you might be able to kind of steer the conversation toward oh well you know your first day's info made made some sense but the second day's is clearly you know wrong and hey who was the person who was sitting next to you that died maybe they were a minion and they're poisoning you yeah or something like that and I think that if you can get people really believing that it is a different demon and that's that's kind of a big thing in uh, sex and violets in general is figuring out how much misinformation there is and Mm -hmm. where it is because that can tell you a lot about where the demon is in the case of an odashi or where the minions are for vigor mortis or just you know what kind of things can happen in the game uh so if you can get them down the wrong path with that it can completely mess up everything basically Mm -hmm. yeah exactly um all right so what other plays do we have here uh, one thing I keep like to keep in mind is that anytime you give true information, if everyone already knows it's a Vortox, it's going to draw suspicion onto you, and that can be good to keep in mind towards the end of the game. You don't have to necessarily have the entire evil team committed to the same plan, so you might have some players giving out true information, some giving out false information, and that gives you flexibility at the end. Uh, if your minions are the ones giving out true information, then you can suddenly pin it on them, make, trying, like acting like they're trying to make it look like there's not a Vortox in play. So like having the Vortox going along with all the misinformation and them giving false information themselves where their minions give true information will help to draw attention to them at the end instead of you. Yeah, that's what we like to uh, call minioning up. You got a minion up yeah. <laughs> near the end uh, draw the suspicion but don't do it too obviously or people will realize oh no we, they just want us to kill them instead of this other person yeah exactly uh, and then you can kind of level yourself where you, you're going back and forth between making it really obvious you're a minion and then you have to figure out are they making it obvious they're a minion because they want us to kill them or not uh, <laughs> but it's good it's good to keep in mind that just giving true information is a way to do that in a vortex game There's also the play where you can try to make it look like the Vortox was in play but isn't anymore. There are a couple ways you can do that. Probably the one that'll come up most often is that you can choose to kill nobody at night, and that'll make it look like a pit hag has changed the demon, since typically the storyteller is supposed to give some kind of indication that the demon has changed when the pit hag does change the demon. So if you just suddenly kill nobody, it can really make it look like, well, the pit hag changed something, and maybe they changed the demon. Uh and that'll make me, people really start reconsidering any info they get from that point on. Yeah, so there, because there are no protection characters in Sex and Violets, and there's no way for yeah. multiple deaths to happen either, except for uh, Pit Hag creating a second demon, which would normally result in the, the storyteller killing uh, two players, usually, um, or if they change the demon into a different demon, which would generally result in them uh, killing nobody, which is really easy to fake. And if you can get people to think either that you were something else and you turned into a vortex so they might think their early information is true mm, or yeah. the other way around would also work um, make their think that their later information is true mm-hmm. yeah and especially if you have a lot of ongoing information characters um, which i guess most characters in sex and violets are ongoing information but there are still games where you'll have like you know seamstress and artist and you just don't end up with that much ongoing information it can also sometimes be a good idea to actually do it of course. Yeah, actually have the pit hag change you into another yeah, demon. Yeah. <laughs> or or change, you know, them or themselves or one of the other minions into a into a demon of some uh one of the other demons. Um just uh you know, they'll know that something changed, but they won't know what changed. It might give you yeah. a way to fangu jump out, you know. I talked about setting somebody up as that earlier, but you could do that if you do think that there is enough suspicion on you that they might come for you soon. And that's really nice to have the Pit Hag as a little bit of an escape hatch since they have so much ability to do things like that. Another thing you can do to make it look like that's happened, um, or at least to make it look like people should be getting true information now, is after a sweetheart dies, uh, to suddenly stop killing. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of a joke play, but it is a real thing that happens where when the sweetheart dies, sometimes you'll make the Vortox drunk. Or yeah, the storyteller listed, will make the Vortox drunk. I mentioned it uh, a little bit further down in our notes, but there is a uh, a video on the Blood on the Clock Tower YouTube channel where John, John Jengset is uh, explaining a game where that happened. And he made the Vortox drunk after a sweetheart died, and it just completely messed things up because the, what, the savant was literally told the Vortox is drunk. But they thought it was false <laughs> because there was a Vortox in the game. Yeah, exactly. So you can bluff that that happened any time after a sweetheart dies, which will... I mean, sweetheart dying doesn't really do anything in a Vortox game. That's something to keep in mind, and that's actually something I mentioned in the like fighting against the Vortox section. Because making a player drunk... They're still not allowed to get tr- like they're not allowed to get true information, even if they're drunk or poisoned. So them being drunk or poisoned it doesn't actually change anyone's ability, uh, really. Like it changes some, yeah. I guess. It changes like snake charm, or it changes the. Uh, are there others? Any any Pluts, of the I guess? action? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Characters, I guess. Um, but it's also yeah. I guess that's really it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah i think so um, um there's so much information in sex and violets that's what i love about it but yeah that can still be a good thing uh to kill them simply because it might give you a way to say oh the sweetheart died so that's why this information is wrong if you are trying to set mm-hmm. up uh pretending that it's not a vortex or something like that even if it really won't do a lot necessarily you yeah, and it, it if it's like towards it the end of the game, if it's towards the end of the game, you can just stop killing and make it look like, oh, the Vortex is drunk. Everyone should start trusting your information again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can also do that. Let's see. What, there's another thing. You can do that if there's an evil twin in play. You can make it look like the Vortex got executed. I mean, any demon can do this. Like, if there's an evil twin in play, you can just stop killing to make it look like whoever somebody was the demon and they died. And that might actually make it so that they then kill the wrong twin because they think that their information is true all of a sudden. Yeah, you've got a list play here too. That's yes, not my fake. list play. <laughs> uh, my list play is to actually kill yourself at night with when there is an evil twin in play to start reversing everyone's information and get them to kill the wrong twin. Uh, they think it's still false, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, um, not sure exactly when this happens, but I feel like it's got to come up so- at some point. Oh, I'm sure. It's, I don't know, I'm like sure something's town prior, happened like, before. <laughs> Yeah, like having a town crier be like, okay, fine, I'll check the twins tomorrow or something. Uh, I don't know. (laughs) That's one of those that I would try, even if it might risk me the game, just because, man, if it works. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, when the demon kills themselves to reverse the info. (laughs) Or to unreverse the info, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, to to reverse reverse it. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, so those are all things you can do with not killing at night to make it look like you're dead. Or to actually be dead. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, specific interactions you want to watch out for with characters. So you can kind of judge who you're up against. Um, I made a big list of lots of townsfolk I thought that had interesting interactions. So we'll start with Oracle. As soon as two good players are dead, the Oracle will get a non-zero number, which might make them suspicious um, that it's a Vortox play and make it very obvious in, that you're in play. So if you want to avoid that, I would suggest trying to get a suspicious player executed on the first day rather than doing something like, oh, okay, let's just kill the clockmaker. Yeah, a lot of the times that I've seen the uh, people find out Vortox really early on, it's been because of an oracle because they don't even need to do anything to kind of test for it almost. Yeah. Because the first two, you know, the first execution in a game is often a clockmaker or somebody who's somewhat trusted, but they want them out of the way for whatever reason. Um, Mm -hmm. and then the, usually the first night death is also going to be somebody that people will somewhat trust, um, unless they have a reason to believe that it's a vigor mortis. So yeah, it's, it can be a little scary if you've got an Oracle cause they'll, they'll probably figure it out fairly quickly when they get a one after the, on the second Mm -hmm. night of the game. Yep. Another character that can figure it out pretty easily is a mathematician, just because it's pretty easy to tell when a mathematician gets bad information, I think. So the thing with Mathematician is um, that's kind of up to the storyteller more whether they want to make it obvious because, I mean, in a a Vortox game, the the true information that a Mathematician is uh, pretty much always going to be greater than zero, and they could always just give the Mathematician a zero to make it look like nobody is, or it's probably not going to be a two either, you know, if they want to make it look Mm -hmm. like an Odashi. So it's kind of up to the storyteller whether a Mathematician's going to be able to notice it or not, or... 
yeah. how much they want to signal that. Yeah, so I just pay attention to what they're saying and then act accordingly. Mathematician can, or does, but doesn't have to be that bad for you. Another one is the juggler. In my opinion, I think that you don't have to be that afraid of jugglers doing normal juggles. If they're doing a specific vortex test where they like juggle, they say, I juggle that I'm the juggler, and then there's, that's sort of turning their info into binary information that they know the answer to. They're basically an artist at that point. Yeah. Um, then you might want to consider killing them just to make it not obvious whether or not you're in play. But if they're just doing a normal juggle where they juggle a bunch of different people as various things, I think that it's usually really hard for them to figure out what part of that is false in a Vortox game. And honestly, while they can do a Vortox test, that also means that they're basically using up their entire ability to do that when it can actually yeah. be a fairly strong ability, which is why there's often juggle parties. So, you know, it's not necessarily the worst thing if they do use it for that either. They'll figure out that it's a Vortox, but... Yeah, I, I think it's poisoned. really... It's worth thinking that if the juggler is choosing to do that, they're turning their ability into... On the second night, well, their ability basically becomes on the first day announced that you're in the game, on the second night, learn whether or not there's a Vortox in play. Mm -hmm. And if like that was a character, it would be the worst character in the game. It was. Uh, so, <laughs> so you don't have to be that afraid of them doing that. <laughs> All right, yeah. Clockmaker, I feel like most of the time isn't going to be that bad against you. Uh, they kind of do rule out certain situations. So just don't make sure you're not pushing for a world where like, the minion and the demon are exactly the distance apart that the clockmaker got. So you'd have to pay attention to them, but it only rules out it rules out a much smaller number of situations than the clockmaker does without a vortex in play. Absolutely. Getting getting a specific number is only so useful if you know that that's the only information that's not true. Oh, well they're yeah. not two <laughs> steps away, but they could be one or three or four. Or... <laughs> but it does help them clear some people potentially. Yeah, like as soon as you have like a cleared person, uh, you get gives you a little bit more confidence in the people on that distance away from them. So, like, don't try to set it up so that those are both the suspicious people. <laughs> Klutz and Snake Charmer are actually really interesting ones. I feel like Snake Charmer is one of the strongest characters against the Vortox. It is. For, or, well, I mean, if, if we go into the situations with Snake Charmer, either at some point they hit you and then you're suddenly able to tell everyone with certainty that it's a Vortox in play. Or they don't ever get you, but they aren't getting any kind of false information because their their ability is a game state change. So no matter what, the Snake Charmer is getting strong information against you. Yeah, the Snake Charmer can be really strong for the good team, not necessarily for the Snake Charmer themselves, but yes, <laughs> um, they can do some really good things. The last game I played, I was a Vortox who got Snake Charmed, and later I was just, you know, able to say, <laughs> Here, here's what's going on. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Klutz also does that to this to to a much lesser extent because you know they have to die for their ability to work and they also have a chance of losing the game. So I would still be happy to kill a Klutz in a Vortox game, even though it does give some uh, true information that doesn't interact with your ability. Absolutely, and I mean, killing honestly, I think killing any of the outsiders is good. I kind of mentioned earlier that a sweetheart might not seem that great, but it still can be. Um, yeah, Klutz, you know. It might give them some information, or it might just cause you to win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that information is only good if they're believed, too, so... Yep. <laughs> if you can get them suspicious, then that's not even helpful either, so... Yeah, exactly. Same idea with the barber, it can be helpful. Yeah, barber, barber's a really good one to kill, I think. I mean, just in general, and that's no different in a Vortex game. What about the Sage? I feel like the Sage is a really good, like, or it's less powerful against Vortox than it usually is. It's absolutely less powerful, but it can still be useful. I would not want to wait too long as a Vortox if I'm going to kill a Sage. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess. A Sage late game would probably not learn very useful information, but they <laughs> would probably realize that it's a Vortox. Yeah, because the, earl the earlier you kill them, the more like they're learning that two people aren't the demon and that's just not as useful right away and also if you do kill them early on then that kind of can give you like that can be in the time when everyone's still figuring out whether or not it's a vortex so maybe you'll be able to get people to um 
kill the people that they point out before realizing it's Vortex Games. And that's when they realize those kills. we killed both yeah. those people and the game hasn't ended. <laughs> yep. So I feel like, yeah, don't be as afraid of killing the sage as most of the other demons should be. But I think that it can still be, um, d- depending later in the game, you know, if there's four people alive and the sage died, the storyteller could, you know, show a dead player or two as some of the people that the sage sees if they already know it's a vortex but they could also show you know two of the other four living people and basically clear them and that can be real risky later later in the game yeah so uh it can still kill you so you know obviously still try to avoid yeah. killing the sage when possible but if everyone trusts them then it might just be worth getting them out of the way absolutely with other demons, later in the game, it would probably be uh, less bad because they'll just point at the two most suspicious players, including you. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of reversed for the Vortox, go figure. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, anyone that gets binary info, like you already mentioned, is going to be just as powerful in a Vortox game, assuming they realize it's a Vortox game. Doesn't really do a whole lot. Uh, your reversing information doesn't really do a whole lot for them once they figure it out. Yeah. One thing that I think... I haven't heard other people mention before is that actually getting your minions to kill people I feel like is more important in a Vortex game because it allows the game or it causes the game to be shorter. So this is specifically with Witch and Mm Saranovis. If you can use Saranovis people at the right time where they feel like they have to break madness and get themselves executed, um, that can be really strong for just shortening the game. And the same thing with Witch... um, getting kills out of the witch so if if i'm one of those minions in a vortex game i'm going to be more inclined to use my ability to get kills than i am to hide it i think that's one of the interesting things in snv is that the uh the minions are so obvious at least compared to the other two base sets Mm -hmm. where you know you can find out for sure if there's a witch in the game if you really want to spend the time doing it early in the game anyway or you can you know You'll almost always know if there's an evil twin or all that kind of thing. And I think that uh, one of the fun things that I like to do as a demon in SNV is try to keep the conversation focused on the minions. Yeah. Instead of the demon, because, you know, if people are dying to the minions, they're going to be really worried about them more than they normally would be, maybe. And they might Mm -hmm. be trying to focus more on killing them, at least earlier in the game. And that's just more time that they aren't trying to kill you. Yeah, exactly. The reason I actually think getting kills is out of minions is more important than a Vortex game, in particular than other demons, uh, is that by shortening the game, it makes it harder to tell if you're in play. And even once people do figure out you're in play, it makes it harder to piece together the information correctly. Just in general, having more information, I think, in a Vortex game is going to... Like, the first piece of information in a Vortex game is almost useless for anybody. Uh, the second piece is a lot more useful and the more you get the more evidence you're going to have about whether or not you should trust your info Every so just shortening the game obvious. is better yeah yeah so i think shortening the game is especially important with the vortex game and actually with that be- with that in mind sometimes the pit hag making a new demon getting two kills at once in a night uh, it if, can do it you, it can yeah. definitely <laughs> help it at the right moment too yeah you can kind of turn that arbitrary kill thing into an upside slightly of the ability <laughs> while, if the uh, storyteller the wants to wants to let you anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> they don't have to do it but they usually will simply because they don't want to leave two demons alive that just makes it that much harder yeah but yeah so just in general thinking of ways to shorten the game and make sure people get less information is good any other thoughts on playing as the vortex uh i actually do have one you mentioned the uh, the evil win the evil twin win condition earlier in this section. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vortox has that other win condition as oh, well. Oh yeah, that's true. Which almost never happens, uh, simply because everybody knows Vortox is an option, so they're gonna execute somebody. But if you can be really convincing early on in the game. Yeah, but there's it not a vortex. Much has to be the first day, right? Yeah, or if you can even just get people distracted long enough that they just don't realize nominations are about to close. I've seen that happen once, and you know, feels bad for good. But if you can play it right, you might be able to get people to just not execute anybody, or <laughs> just you know, oh, we needed five votes and we only got four. Well, I don't know what we're gonna do now. Yeah, there, are, there is a, a situation. It is possible that. 
if the ghost votes work out right in the end of the game, it can be that you like tie at six votes or something. And then there's just not enough votes left in the game without the evil players voting to get better than that. So you can force a Vortox win like that as well. Yep, tying can be pretty awesome as well. Yeah, it, it kind of has to be a high number where people used a lot of dead votes in order for it to work. Yeah, um, otherwise good's almost certainly going to say, no, we need to kill somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and probably have found out who you are at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that that is definitely a good thing to keep in mind. I think the most common time that it's going to work is on the first day. Uh, if yeah either really early or really late are about the only times that it's gonna gonna work out for you probably yeah but yeah, it is so, it uh, is an option <laughs> that a lot of people yeah. forget about and i think i guess the way to do that is just to on the first day try to make it look like there's not a vortex in play and if you can get people confident enough in that and also not confident that they have a good target to kill then that would be the best way to make them not execute someone uh then late in the game it's just tying it's all about tying yeah <laughs> Um, all right, let's talk about fighting against the Vortox. What, what are your thoughts here? On the, you're a good team member. What are you doing to combat the Vortox? Obviously, you don't know they're in play, but like. Uh, so one of the something that I mentioned a little bit earlier is that in S and V, one of the most important things is basically to figure out which evil characters you have in play before yeah. you can really figure out who they are. Um, because all of the the demons and the minions just make things so different. Mm -hmm. And the demons specifically are going to change how and where there's misinformation. That's the only uh, misinformation from the evil team in SNV. Um, so if you can figure out, you know, sharing information, talking to each other, you, you really need to be sharing your information so that you can figure out, well, okay, this doesn't make any sense with this, or only a couple people have wrong information, or nothing is making any sense at all. Um, to kind of figure out where you're at. So one, you know whether you need to execute, obviously. Execute? Definitely day one. You probably just want to make sure you execute somebody, even if it's a dead body, uh, throughout the entire game. Yeah, I think I think that's an important thing to remember that not everyone realizes, is that you can just execute dead bodies to satisfy the Vortex, which is, you know, that's why exactly. that second part of their ability actually isn't as strong as it seems. Well, and I think that the execution... Uh, section of it isn't so much about killing someone as it is making sure that there are nominations and votes for some of yep. the other characters like flower girl and town crier that are on the script to have the reversed information because if just nobody nominated day one flower girl and town crier would both know for sure that it's a vortex almost for sure that it's a vortex without anyone yep. even having to do anything and with no chance to mess it up <laughs> But yeah, anyway, executing dead bodies uh, is a good thing to do. I mean, uh, uh, executing players is how the good team wins, so like you still probably want to do that. But um... Yeah, but if there's, you know, depending on the counts, the, the player counts that are going on, or yeah, just having no real good target, sometimes you just want to execute a dead body. Or if you just don't think that you can get enough people to agree... Because sometimes half the people are going to think this one, and half of them are going to think that, and neither of them is going to get enough votes. Well, yeah, or like you, <laughs> or like you do tie on somebody. Like everybody has people they want to die, but then you just end up tying, and it's like, well, we don't want to kill one of the other people, so oh we yeah, make sure it's not a tie. We can you can just kill a dead body. Yeah, so most of the time, the biggest thing where you're going to have to make an execution when you might not want to is day one. A witch getting a kill can help you out there, where you can then just execute whoever the witch killed. Yep, also helps you learn <laughs> that you've got a witch. Yeah. <laughs> Executing, I mean, in the Clockmaker episode, which... I, did I release the Clockmaker yes, episode Yes, that was yet? the first episode. I did. Yes, we already talked a lot about... Appropriately. <laughs> um, yeah, we already talked a lot about executing the Clockmaker, so we don't need to talk about that more here. If you want to hear about that, go listen to that episode. There's also things like getting the mutant killed or getting somebody who's been targeted by Saranovas killed. Those are both good ways to execute somebody on the first day as well. Um, they obviously require the storyteller to go along with it, but you can kind of, you can influence your storyteller's and decision if, there. If it is a, a Saranovis execution on day one, which I've definitely seen happen before, uh, if it's before there have even been any nominations, you can kind of have that thing where Flower Girl and Town Crier will get some very useful information out of that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I like doing that with mutant as well. That's a way to make the mutant very powerful. Like if you're just going to kill a random person on day one that you actually trust, you might as well have it be you as the minion or 
as the mutant, it's a lot harder to get your storyteller to go along with that because if they think that's what you're doing, then they're probably going to see exactly. that it's going to benefit you, not hurt you. Um, but you know, you can always you can act like you forgot or something. You can be like, what? Like if somebody says something to you, you can claim like. I don't know, like sweetheart or something, and then just be like, "Oh, I forgot that's an outsider." You know, uh, <laughs> what? Trying to game the storyteller? <laughs> do it. Do Always it. do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're part of the game. <laughs> We're playing the game just as much as you are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's a very strong thing for the mutant to do if they can get away with it. <laughs> Another thing on the topic of fighting against the Vortox, and this is something that I've just realized recently, and I love it. Uh, similar to how we were talking earlier about the sweetheart not making uh, much of a difference in Vortox games, because drunken poison doesn't do anything, the philosopher becomes a lot more powerful in a Vortox game. You can, for instance, duplicate a savant, and now you have two equally useful in- savants in play, um, because both of them are getting reliably false information. And that's basically true for uh, any of the information characters in the game. Yeah. Regardless of whether you're poisoned or not, you're still going to receive false info. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it doesn't work with, that's actually a case where the philosopher turning into like Snake Charmer is worse than usual. Yeah. Uh, Because if there is another Snake Charmer, it'll make them uh, drunk. But if there's... But if you turn into any other character, you can just do that and know that there is no chance you're going to hurt someone else if you're reasonably confident there's a Vortox in play. I also, uh, in that last game I played where I was the Vortox, bluffed a savant, bluffed a philosopher into savant for that exact reason. <laughs> nice. Oh uh, yeah, I just turned into savant because I know that it wasn't gonna, you know, really make a difference because there's a Vortox in play, so we're just all receiving false things. <laughs> yeah, so that's... That's the really good thing with philosopher. You can just become whatever's most useful, and you don't have to worry about if that thing's already in the game. Um, although, I, you know, you, I would still avoid, like, um, duplicating a flower girl or something, because then you're going to just have two people giving the, the exact same, same information. information. Which, you know, that could be useful if... Because you know that you're going to get the same info as the other character uh, that you've duplicated. Well, and that can be interesting so that can be if a good... you uh, don't know if they're evil or not. Yeah, exactly. So if you get them to give their info first and you've got different information, then like 100% they're evil if it's a Vortox. In play. Obviously, they'll probably know what the correct information uh, would be, but they don't You don't know if they're trying to pretend that it's not a Vortox or something like that. Yeah. So. Um, and it's also, uh, your, your storyteller might hate you if you philosopher into a savant and there's already one in the game. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, because as Coming we're going to get to in the storyteller section... <laughs> Savant is the hardest character with Vortox, I believe. <laughs> it is. All right, let's talk about that. Um, section three, running this uh, Vortox as storyteller. I was going to say running the Savant as storyteller because that's what it feels like to me. I always put them together accidentally, forgetting that it's a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not that bad. But yeah. Um, so I think we both agree on this first point here about running the Vortox as storyteller, which is double check every piece of information you ever give because if you ever give true information it's gonna suck (laughs) yep i think that uh as you kind of talked about in your overview of snv episode um it's an addition where it's even more important snv and bmr both to basically treat yourself as stupider than you are just (laughs) double check thing You, you you know what you're doing double check it anyway I've seen experienced storytellers, official storytellers, make a mistake by giving true info with a Vortox. <laughs> yeah. It's very easy to do. Just just really be watching yourself. Well, it's a lot easier matters. to come up with true information than it is than with false, because you're literally looking at the grimoire and going, oh yeah, yep. there, that's right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and since in Sex and Violets in general, you're going to want to prepare information ahead of time. It's important to pay attention to character changes, which can change that. So, for instance, a pit hag creating or removing a Vortox might invalidate some of the preparation you've done and just be aware that that can happen. I've definitely messed up a game where I planned out a whole series of pieces of information to give during the night that all, like, you know, work together in interesting ways or whatever. Uh, I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to tell the dreamer if they pick this person and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then right away, the pit hag creates a Vortox 
and I forget to change the information and ruin that game. So uh, nice. It's very easy to do that. So just really make sure you think about the consequences of every character change, and especially uh, also prepping savant statements during the night. You, I would usually do that right at the end of the night. That way, I know everything else that's happened during the night, and I'll be keeping in mind there's a vortex because uh, if you have to come up with something on the spot, it's going to be bad. Same with the artist. If they ask you a question, make sure you give them a false answer. Uh, it's it's a little bit harder, I think, for those two daytime characters because you're not thinking as much about the other characters in the game during the day. Another one is to the mathematician. Uh, if you make up a wild high number, make sure it's not actually the correct number of <laughs> pe- players getting misinformation. Uh, <laughs> it can actually be really hard to keep track of that for mathematician more so than usual because every piece of information that you're giving is false. You need to make sure that that one number is not the one that you give to the mathematician, so you still need to count it. Yeah, and it it especially happens later in the game. Like, at the first day, if you give, like, a six, it's not going to change. Even if that's accidentally true, it's not really going to change anything, because that's obviously just telling the mathematician there's a vortex in play. So, like, even if you give them true info accidentally, it's not like they're going to figure that out later and be like, oh, that means there can't be a vortex in play. But... It can play into other things, so it's still important to keep make sure it isn't accidentally true. And especially later in the game when you're, there might only be like two pieces of misinformation, don't tell the mathematician a two. <laughs> yeah, any other thoughts on Vortex? Uh, not too much. It's it's not as scary as it sounds, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to act like it is. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's, it's really one of the defining sort of characteristics of the script, um, which is why I was excited to record about it. But it's not as scary as it seems when you first are looking at it, and it's definitely able to be dealt with. Yeah, like all the tools fit in. Uh, there's all the tools there in Sex and Violets. Lots of binary information, lots of information that's useful even when it's false. It's kind of how S and V is sort of the grown up TB a little bit, where just everybody's getting information, but it's not trustworthy, and you need to figure out why. Mm hmm. Instead of a poisoner and a drunk, you've got the various demons. Yeah. Um, so I think overall takeaways are, if you are the Vortox, always think about the narrative. If you're fighting against the Vortox... Always think about the narrative. Ex- no. ex- execute dead people? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you execute. The... <laughs> Kill the demon. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you're fighting against the Vortox, uh, execute them. If you are <laughs> running the Vortox as the storyteller, uh, don't tell the truth. <laughs> Make sure that you don't tell the truth. Tell anything but the truth. Yes. <laughs> and I, I mean, I guess technically don't give things that are neither true nor false. Like, don't give the savant an opinion, but that's, like, always something you shouldn't be doing. So <laughs> This is true. Uh, <laughs> or is it false? No. Um, but yeah. <laughs> In, unless, you know, the Vortex is drunk or something. Yeah. And then make sure that you are paying attention to that. In the yep. rare case that it would happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. I think that about wraps it up then. All right. Uh, th- thanks for talking to me about this, Brian. I'm glad you wanted to talk about the Vortex. And I think it's a good one that we're going to be getting done relatively early. Um, it's a little bit like in, in Trouble Brewing, I saved the demon for the end. And even though to some extent the Vortex is like the demon of Sex and Violets, it's, there's four of them. So Yeah, you, could, you can kind of spread them out a little bit. I also think it's uh, one of those that's kind of important to talk about little bit earlier on because it's going to affect a lot of what the other episodes are going to be talking about too yeah for sure all right well thank you everyone for listening and you'll hear from me and another guest in a couple weeks (laughs) 